Hi all, our instructive game today will be about not underestimating the coiled spring. To demonstrate this theme, I'm going to choose the game Robert J. Fisher against James T. Sherwin, played in 1957. So this was when Fisher was quite young. And Sherwin, by the way, has travelled to the UK and is actively playing now and still doing very well. You know, he's a very strong, you know, 200 ish ECF player. Um, you know, still quite a solid international master. So, in this game, he was black, and Fisher kicked off with e4. And after c5, knight f3, e6, Fisher now played a seemingly quiet passive move, d3. So, why would he want to do this? He's blocking in his own bishop, and after knight c3, he's finchettering it here. So, we have the makings of later a coiled spring type of action where these pieces um, will spring into life. At the moment they're all behind the pawns except for the knight. So there's latent energy you could say in white's position. And when black played rook b8, who would imagine that these distant outpost points of h7 and b8 would be tactical targets for white, given, given white's kind of passive looking position with all the pieces tucked behind the pawns. Who would possibly imagine that later there, there will become tactical weaknesses which Fisher, Fisher exploited? So after c3, we see now that white has a plan emerging in the centre to gain space with later d4 and e5. And that will give the white queen scope on this diagonal for attacking that target later. But also potentially after e5, we can see that if the d6 pawn is removed later, this bishop might also be useful on this diagonal. So this is with the benefit of hindsight visually annotating the implications at the moment. Because, you know, who would have thought with black, you know, there's no, nothing to worry about because, you know, surely, you know, the position's not open. So it's how the position opens up soon which causes these tactical targets of b7, sorry, the b8 and h7 to be exploitable. So after d4, queen c7, Sherwin is, is still, you know, oblivious to this kind of explosion effect that White's going to unleash now when he opens the position up by first, you know, playing for this e5 move. So he plays e5 now, and all of a sudden we see some tactical implications. After knight d5, which was played, maybe d takes e5 is better. Let's have a quick look. This is an alternative variation. But Ribker actually likes white in this kind of position to play a3 with the idea of playing c4. And gives white a slight advantage here if black tries to play c4 himself. So that's not too too bad for white either. In the game though, maybe this is inferior. What Sherwin played was just knight d5. So in doing so, you know, he's taking some liberties actually with his h7 potential weakness. But also this b8 weakness is simultaneously targeted now by Fisher. First, Fisher plays e takes d6. And look how this knight on d2 comes to life now. After bishop takes d6, knight e4. So the threat is now knight takes d6, and potentially c4 followed by bishop f4, skewering the queen against the rook on b8. So black, trying to stop white from playing c4, and also establish positionally this seemingly nice knight on d5, plays c4 himself. So is this okay for black? No, white still takes on d6, even though there isn't the threat immediately of bishop takes f4 to skewer that queen and rook. Fisher now plays his other knight, his remaining knight, to g5. And now some emerging threats are on the horizon. Queen h5, queen c2, and also bishop e4 are potential threats to try and gang up on the h7 pawn. Sherwin maybe should have kicked the knight immediately with h6. So let's have a look. h6 immediately, knight h3, bishop b7, and maybe, you know, black is better than in the game. But uh, again, Rivka likes white, you know, with knight f4, gives, gives white a slight edge. In the game, showing he left that knight on g5 now, he, he played knight c e7. And this gave Fisher the opportunity now to probe that h7 weakness in a seemingly, you know, harmless threat, innocuous. But actually, there was more to it. So he played queen c2, threatening this mate with queen takes h7. And after knight g6, all of a sudden, this is quite astonishing, actually, that after h4, in virtually all black's candidate moves now, you know, white has an advantage. 
um, f5, f6, h6, it's all an advantage for white by, you know, almost the pawn that Ribka gives. So what was played in the game was knight f6. So here, can you spot the cunning tactical idea which Fisher played now? I gave you a clue earlier saying that there were two tactical vulnerabilities on different sides of the board now to exploit simultaneously. Fisher plays a brilliant move now which Ribka completely agrees with, which is incredible really. It's a very precise technical move. So I'll, let, I'll give you five seconds from now to see if you can spot it. The move Fisher played was knight takes h7. So let's have a look at this. In the game knight takes h7 was played, but say king takes h7 was played. Now bishop f4, simply using that pin on g6 to skewer the queen and rook, just clearly winning the exchange. So in the game, actually knight takes h7 was played. And Fisher now simply played the seemingly quiet move h5. So saying if the knight moves back, then bishop f4 is on. So he's regaining his knight now because of this horrible threat of bishop f4. And he's really punishing black for losing that dark square bishop as well, positionally, earlier. So white is really creating a big advantage now. Sherwin actually played knight h4. And Fisher, instead of taking that knight, first played bishop f4 to chase the queen away. The queen went back to d8. Sherwin's trying to be aggressive now with his queen on black's king, but it isn't really supported. So Fisher took on h4, and now black has to do something about that rook. He offers the exchange. So if Fisher took the exchange now, maybe black has some compensation with later queen d5, attacking white on the light squares. Instead, Fisher goes for Black's king. He doesn't. He's not interested in winning the exchange. He wants to weaken Black on the king side by playing h6, even offering showing the h4 pawn, which was then taken. And after hg, king takes. Now Fisher plays rook e4. So he's using that queen as a tactical target, as well as keeping this tactical target on b7. So after queen h5, now rook e3 is played. Another very good clinical move which um, Rivka likes as well. So black is really getting busted here because of the threats of rook g3, bishop e5. Black now played f5. So obviously, positionally, this is awful, creating this uh, backward pawn on the semi-open e file. But also, you know, the black king is still in trouble. Rook h3 now. The queen can't go to g6 because of rook g3. So it goes all the way back to e8. And now Fisher executes black elegantly with this check and after knight f6 gets his queen on the dark squares. Queen d2 now with the idea of coming in with queen g5. So after king f7, queen g5. Black defends f6 but it's hopeless because remember black also has this tactical target all that time and now Fisher uses that for his final winning decisive combination just taking on f6 and rook h7 check. So after king e8 Fisher just takes on f6 and if the queen is recaptured, white wins the whole rook with bishop takes b7. Sherwin played rook takes h7 instead, still completely hopeless. And bishop c6, he resigned here. So the coiled spring had kind of exploded, exploiting these, these seemingly long distance weaknesses in black's position. Who would have fought from white's passive opening? Let's have a look at that in slow motion again, in overview and summary. So this coiled kind of spring position really came to life with Fisher moving his pawns in the center and just, you know, aiming for this e5. So he's liberating potentially all the lines, the, 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 this line, this line, this line. So which meant that these were actually exploitable weaknesses, believe it or not. And when black lost that dark squared weakness, Bishop, especially this skewer tactic, came to light as being really on the cards now. After this queen c2, the magnificent move h4, extremely logical, with the idea of further threatening things on the h7 pawn. So Sherwin really you know, had a bad position now, and Fisher just steadily increased the advantage using this tactical combination. So black was still desperately weak on these dark squares, still with that target now that rook on the queen side he couldn't do anything about with these raking bishops on on the queen side so rook b7 was offered on a plate but fisher just ruthlessly went for the king by ripping open black's king and using the queen to gain some valuable tempo now for the final attack so in this final winning combination it was very easy 
So Bishop C6 and Sherman resigned. I hope you enjoyed that game. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.